Good evening, everybody. Uh, firstly, to our very distinguished uh, guest, uh, His Grace Sir Bishop Corliss. Welcome, Sir Edna. Uh, to uh, Professor Dianne Speed, the, the Dean of the uh, uh, Sydney College Divinity. Uh, Professor Jim Harrison, Director of Research at the Sydney College Divinity. Professor Peter Bolt, Director of Learning and Teaching. Uh, Reverend Fathers, lecturers and guests. Uh, on behalf of our Dean, uh, Dr. Father Daniel Fernus and all the lecturers, I'd like to welcome you to this third event uh, that we're hosting here at St. Cyril's. It's actually our, our second event at the new premises. It's been uh, six months of us uh, having settled in, well, still settling in, um, but it's uh, wonderful to have you all uh, here with us. Um, as many of you know, St. Cyril's uh, Theological College uh, is the uh, Sydney Diocese uh, College under the leadership of His Grace Bishop Daniel. We've been operating since 1982 and have educated generations of the faithful here in Sydney and around the world. In 2015, we took the bold step of seeking accreditation uh, through the Sydney College of Divinity, which is the, the premier provider of theological education in our neck of the woods. Uh, and uh, three of our distinguished guests here tonight are uh, representatives of the Sydney College of Divinity. So working under the uh, Sydney College of Divinity has been a wonderful and enriching experience for us here at St. Cyril's. The quality of the education that we uh, provide here is a direct result of the uh, fruitful relationship that we have with the SCD and, and the guidance that we have, and thank you very much for that. We really do appreciate everything that you've done for us. Uh, so on behalf of everyone at St. Cyril's, I'd like to thank uh, the SCD for their support and guidance, and God willing, look forward to a very long and prosperous relationship with you. Um, uh, and all, through the SCD also to all of our uh, sister theological colleges uh, who are mem also members of the Sydney College Divinity. It's a wonderful experience for us to have this uh, ecumenical relationship with, with various denominations through, through the SCD. So that's a, a really beautiful aspect of that particular um, uh, setup. So thank you very much for that. As always, uh, we're very thankful to Sayedna, uh, uh, His Grace Bishop Daniel, who's blessed this endeavour of ours and given us the support from day one. And we hope uh, that Sadna through his intercessions uh, will be able to serve this blessed diocese of Sydney to bear fruit 30, 60 and 100 fold for the glory of God. Also on behalf of uh, all of the staff in the college, I'd like to thank our Dean, uh, Abuna Daniel. Uh, he's uh, our Dean, lecturer and all around superman who does pretty much everything around the college. And uh, none of us would know what we would do without him. So thank you very much Abuna for all the work that you do here, uh, seen and unseen. Um, and of course, our warmest welcome to His Grace Bishop Crawdless. It's wonderful to have His Grace here on our shores. Uh, this is like a uh, nice uh, wintry uh, California day. Uh, uh, so uh, thank you for uh, uh, joining us on, on, on this day. His Grace represents a new generation of the Episcopate, having grown up in the US, dedicated to the diaspora context, theologically trained and articulate. Uh, His Grace is the Dean of St. Athanasius and St. Cyril's Theological College at Claremont University. He's an auxiliary bishop serving alongside His Eminence Metropolitan Serapion uh, of Los Angeles. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Communication Studies from UCLA, a Juris Doctor degree from Georgetown University Law Center. He also earned two Master's degrees in Theology from Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology in uh, Boston and a PhD in History of Christianity from the University of Notre Dame School of Theology in Indiana. I had the distinct pleasure of meeting His Grace a few months ago at the Land of Immigration Conference uh, in uh, New Jersey, where His, uh, His Grace presented one of the keynote uh, talks uh, concerning the pedagogical approaches in church education. Speaking to His Grace afterwards, I expressed my admiration and also a desire on behalf of all of us here at St. Cyril's for collaboration and exchange between our colleges. And I thank God that this day has come and that we can benefit from His Grace's knowledge and wisdom. God willing, this lecture will signal the growth of this collaboration as the various accredited colleges in the diaspora band together uh, to express our ancient faith in a new way and in a new context. And perhaps His Grace Bishop Daniel can uh, intercede on our behalf and invite Sayedna back again uh, to Sydney to uh, lecture an extended course uh, at the college. That would be an absolute joy and a blessing for us. So, uh, uh, please make sure Sayedna hears that and beg him. <laughs> uh, tonight's lecture is titled uh, The Life-Giving Blessings, St. Cyril of Alexandria and the Liturgy of the Eucharist. It's exciting to witness a scholarly reassessment of this great saint. The early 20th century saw an unfortunate trend in academia of St. Cyril bashing, based predominantly on some very unflattering historical accounts of his opponents. In the last 20 years, we've witnessed a resurgence in the interest in the real St. Cyril, 
not Cyril the pugilistic caricature, but the saint, an exegete whose large-scale meditations on scripture were derailed by a fight largely, largely not of his own making. Well, that's our account at least. We're a little bit biased here. We are at St. Cyril's Theological College. But uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome His Grace uh, to his lecture. Please uh, give him a very warm round of applause. Thank you very much for that uh, uh, extensive introduction. Um, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to means of collaboration. It was something that I was trying to actually attend uh, with you last year, but unfortunately that had to be rescheduled uh, for uh, reasons uh, beyond my control. Um, but I, I thank you again for the invitation and also uh, to this school, which is dedicated to St. Cyril of Alexandria, who is uh, one that's very uh, near and dear for me personally. Um, and I'll apologize in advance. Uh, anytime I speak about St. Cyril, usually we go past the time. But uh, Wuna Daniel uh, assured me there is no time. <laughs> so, <laughs> so maybe we'll be here <laughs> longer than we thought. No, I've, I've uh, limited the slides to make sure that I, I won't go too far. Uh, but especially this subject, which is St. Cyril, usually when he's spoken about, and m many authors, when they write about St. Cyril, they usually do not focus on his Eucharistic understanding. And even when they do so, uh, the mention and the link with the liturgy attributed to him is also one of the uh, areas that's uh, not really ha has been investigated at all. Liturgical scholars have dealt with the matter, but from a historical perspective, and one of those uh, scholars who spent 10 years to study the writings of St. Cyril, and unfortunately he passed away before he published all of it, uh, so it was published posthumously, but it was not really completed. Um, and at the same time, even with that work, there wasn't much account made for his own personal writings in which he develops a very unique and deep theology of the Eucharist. So I just want to go through uh, a few themes in the writing of St. Cyril um, and connect it with the liturgy attributed to his name because it's one of the uh, unique uh, anaphora prayers that are still in existence today and being used uh, consistently by the Coptic Church uh, since uh, at least the time of 450, as we know, probably before that time. Uh, so the first theme which you'll find is called the bloodless sacrifice. This title is unique to St. Cyril, although it's referred to uh, in, by many other fathers, but throughout his writings this could be a term that relates to the Eucharist. It uh, dates or comes uh, to Malachi 1, which is a unique verse or two verses that are cited in the ancient Egyptian liturgies. And this citation, if you find it in any anaphora, it's almost, you're able to identify that anaphora as being Egyptian. So the, the verses read, for which reason the door shall be shut before you and you will not kindle my altar in Baal. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord Almighty. I will not receive a sacrifice from your hands because from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name has been glorified among the nations. And in every place incense and a pure sacrifice is offered to my name. For this reason, my name is great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. This verse, which was adapted by St. Cyril to give us this title of the bloodless sacrifice, it's something found as early as St. Justin's writings, where he relates the bloodless sacrifice to the Eucharist and the bread and the cup, which has are presented by Christians in all places throughout the world. By the time of Patriarch Athenagoras, he refers this phrase to uh, the sacrifice that's mentioned in Romans 12, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. And by the time of St. Irenaeus, that he puts uh, the two together and adds a third, which is the praise that we offer to God, a sacrifice of praise. So this understanding of bloodless sacrifice has multiple understandings or multiple uh, uh, points of reflection within the first 300 years. St. Cyril, which is categor 
categoristic or uh, characteristic of him, which is to take a theme such as this and expand it into several volumes, uh, almost um, as, as one of the professors says, if St. Athanasius says it once, St. Cyril has to say it 10 times in different ways to give you the full meaning of, uh, of what he says. So in one of his earliest works on worship of God and spirit and truth, which is not yet translated, we're trying to publish it, uh, hopefully will take some, some not too long to do so. He quotes Malachi 1, 10 and 11, and he gives this very important introduction. He says he remembers the times in which he will be offered as the rational sacrifice by all the peoples of the earth, that which is bloodless and overwhelming. This <clears throat> brief, again, he says it briefly, he will repeat it again in the Glafira and other places to refer to um, the sacrifice of the Eucharist. For we have been called in Christ no longer perform sacred rites through blood and smoke, nor do we offer to God lambs or goats. Rather, we celebrate in the churches a holy and spiritual sacrifice which is spiritually apprehended in Christ when we bring forth the offering for sanctification and participation in eternal life. We offer, like some select incense, the sweet aromas issuing from sacrificial rites, and by making a sacrifice of righteousness to him, we have confidence that we will also be acceptable. So you notice here that the sacrifice of the Eucharist is now added a new understanding, which is of incense. And in the liturgy of St. Cyril, incense is the, and the censer is the picture of the sacrifice, uh, which is why when we read, or when we say this part, Malachi 1.11, and it's quoted in the liturgy of St. Cyril, there is incense that has to be offered on the altar and on the offering. So in this, in this passage, we find the Romans, sorry, it be Romans 12, uh, the Eucharist, and incense as the liturgical rites that refer to this bloodless sacrifice. <clears throat> bloodless sacrifice uh, is always an understanding of the sacrifice of Christ that is continually offered in the church. It is something that we uh, take uh, in the liturgical um, worship during Great Friday, especially in the sixth hour, as well as the ninth and twelfth hours, where incense is offered during the most important hymns that relate to the sacrifice of Christ. Uh, so once we, we, we uh, recall Christ's crucifixion and his offering, that the priest will uncover his head and offer incense. The same thing which can be said for the raising of incense itself, that in the evening raising of incense, that the cross is always symbolic in any movement uh, that is uh, done, any of the rubrics. <clears throat> the bloodless sacrifice also relates to the Eucharistic offering, as uh, we, we uh, said from the, the ancient Egyptian prayers, as early as the Strasbourg Papyrus, which is probably the oldest liturgical prayer uh, that we have. It's a fragment. Some people date it as early as 250, other people date it uh, as uh, late as 300 or 350. The Eucharist of Serapion, the liturgy according to St. Cyril, based on Chrysostom, they all have this understanding of uh, sacrifice as the Eucharist. <clears throat> the third theme, which is the Christian offering and the knowledge of Christ or the Christian life, you find that St. Cyril, uh, as well as uh, other fathers before him, they will uh, mix these themes together. In one passage, St. Cyril takes Ephesians 5, this offering and sacrifice to God as a sweet-smelling aroma. And he relates it to the sacrifice that Christ makes. And he says in the Eucharist, when Christ offers his sacrifice, we are also offering our sacrifice. And our sacrifice is mixed with his sacrifice as if the incense, which is being uh, uh, joined by a, a skilled perfumer, as mentioned in Exodus and Leviticus. So that the two are offered together. And the priest, when he offers the sacrifice, is the same. It's that sacrifice for himself, it's Christ's sacrifice, but it's also the sacrifice of the people. <clears throat> he says, um, oh, we, we recalled this already, and then finally the prayer of the saints, which is mentioned in the book of Revelation, the incense has this theme. 
So if I were to ask you a question among these four, which do you find or which do you expect to be represented in the liturgy of St. Cyril? Um, when, I, when I teach the course, I ask ad, as a quiz <laughs> for them this question. And to provide, you would have to have some background of the liturgy uh, according to St. Cyril. As you know, it is the longest liturgy that we have, and it takes at least a half an hour to an hour more, depending on which hymns uh, that you say. That's why it's not the most popular <laughs> liturgy that we have, and it's probably rare. I don't know for you um, in Sydney, but I know uh, in Los Angeles until a few years ago, it was rare uh, to hear it, but now during the Great Lent, it's uh, usually said during the week. Uh, sometimes on Sunday, but typically not. Um, so if I were to ask you which one, the incense is used in liturgy according to St. Cyril with this meaning. Um, any guesses? Okay, well, it's actually all of them. <laughs> it's a multiple, multiple choice uh, question. And I'll show you different uh, prayers uh, in the anaphora according to St. Cyril. The first one, which is uh, what we mentioned already from Malachi, that represents the, uh, the sacrifice of Christ as well as the Eucharistic uh, offering. That's why uh, the declaration about Christ's sacrifice as well as the Eucharist, the incense is being used there. These, this is some uh, rough sketch of how it could have developed, this one prayer. Uh, from Malachi to the Stress Book of Papyrus to Greek Mark and Coptic Cyril. Unfortunately, Greek Mark we don't have. Uh, it's, it was um, a, uh, a theory that uh, Cumming had, uh, the one who uh, worked on this for 10 years. But it's only a sketch based on the papyri that we have, fragments, and compared to the earliest uh, version of uh, the liturgy according to St. Cyril. They believed in the 5th century this was the Coptic translation of the Greek with modifications to the liturgy that was originally uh, with the name of Mark. Um, and this was the liturgy that was uh, practiced in Alexandria uh, for some time until, again, it took the name of St. Cyril. Uh, we also have later uh, two prayers that are added to the liturgy of St. Cyril. One is a prayer of the veil, um, and one is a prayer of reconciliation attributed to St. Severus of Antioch, which refers to the Eucharist as a rational, bloodless, and spiritual sacrifice. So again, this becomes, that's why it becomes a very important phrase for Egyptian and Afra. Um, <clears throat> the second prayer, which is the litany of oblations, there's eight of them <laughs> in the liturgy of St. Cyril. Uh, so in the litany of oblations, which is one of the many litanies that we say uh, that's what makes the liturgy a little bit long, is that all the litanies we have, it's the start of uh, the, the liturgy of St. Cyril. Um, <clears throat> so the sacrifices, offerings, thanksgivings to those who have offered to the honor of your glory name. Uh, <clears throat> this term we don't have time to go into, but sacrifices is usually referred to this Eucharistic sacrifice. Offerings as well, but the prosphora, the same thing. And the thanksgivings, uh, which is another term for the different types of prayers that we have uh, in the church. So this is also done with incense. Anytime we say the litany of the offering, whether it's in uh, uh, blessing of the waters, or it's done in the uh, matins prayer, or it's done in any other occasion, incense is offered for this purpose. So it's understanding of this Eucharistic offering. <clears throat> there is another time where in, uh, I mentioned the veil prayer and the prayer of reconciliation that refer to the Eucharist. Uh, we also have the litany of the patriarch. Um, so when we pray for the patriarch, we say, receive your, upon your holy, heavenly, and rational altar as a sweet savor of incense, which is this, the prayers which the patriarch and the pope and the priests offer on our behalf, and also that we offer on behalf of the people. So all of this, the two gifts, so uh, the Eucharistic offering as well as the Christian offering, again, incense is used uh, in this prayer. 
um, the same thing for rise of the Lord, let your enemies be scattered. And uh, th this is unique to St. Cyril, holy, holy, holy. You will notice in the prayers of the uh, litany, liturgy of the word, that you al we always have in the Coptic rite <clears throat> the antiphonal uh, singing, praises, between the North Choir and the South Choir, uh, especially in the first half of the liturgy. But after we reach the creed and we go to the anaphora proper, that is no longer existing. It's only between east and west. And this is the picture of the sanctus, what they call the holy, 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 and all of the traditions. And it's usually as one unit, a pre-sanctus, a sanctus, and a post-sanctus. But in the liturgy of St. Cyril, it's unique that when the priest says holy, 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 there is incense that's offered around the altar. And most people think that it's a mistake because in Basil and Gregory, it's not done. But this picture is done for the same thing that we are starting, or it's the center of the anaphora prayers. And so incense is offered in the most important parts of that prayer. As if, as if when the priest starts uh, an import, a new prayer, he will say, let us pray, and the deacon will say, uh, stand up in prayer. As if to say the same thing, when we're starting an, a new major part of the anaphora, they will offer incense or to conclude. For example, the institution narrative is the same. In the night which he gave himself up, that he might suffer for our sins and death which he accepted by his own will for us all. When the priest says this, again he offers uh, incense. And it's the start of the institution narrative, and by the, the conclusion, he will say the same thing for every time you eat of this bread. Incense is also offered around the altar. It's very unique to the liturgy of St. Cyril, but it's relating to this theme of the bloodless sacrifice. Um, and finally, for the prayer of the departed, uh, we have that final theme. The second theme, which is the bread of life uh, in the teaching of St. Cyril. And it's very appropriate that we speak about it now. Uh, we just began the month of Amshir, and the month of Amshir is focused on this theme of bread of life. In the discourse of St. Cyril, according to uh, St. John chapter 6, uh, he, goes, he proceeds through his um, commentary on the Gospel of John in a very unique way, probably unique than any other father. Uh, so it takes two volumes <laughs> uh, for St. Cyril to explain. When he reaches to chapter 6, he writes about 150 pages just on this one chapter to speak about the bread of life. That is how much, how important this theme of the bread of life is for St. Cyril. Because it has many uh, a deep uh, understanding uh, for him, and I'll touch on four of them. The first one, which is the Holy Scriptures, because the bread of life is usually interpreted uh, in this way. Uh, that's why he says the five barley loaves signify the five-fold book of the all-wise Moses, that is the whole law. And he says the two fish are signified uh, because of the fishermen to indicate the books of the disciples. And these two, uh, he says, the apostolic and evangelical proclamation shine forth among us. Both of these are literary drafts and spiritual writings of the fishermen. The Savior, having mixed the new with the old by the law and the teaching of the new covenant, nourishes the souls of those who believe in him to life, namely to eternal life. So for him, the bread of life is understanding how the disciples are, Christ blesses, and the disciples, they give and they share this, uh, this teaching of the Old and New uh, Testament. Um, he also uh, uses a couple of different times in Exodus that the menna in the wilderness or the golden vessel with the menna represent the same thing, the gospel teachings provided for us in uh, precious uh, truth. The second thing, which is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Again, this is unique. St. Cyril has a very elaborate theology of the Holy Spirit or a pneumatology um, to the point where uh, he is one of the few fathers to cite Second Peter uh, for the particulars of divine nature more than any other father and many times to relate it and connect it to the work of the Holy Spirit in sanctification of humanity. 
this work of the Holy Spirit um, is, uh, like I said, a unique part in his theology, and he'll find it uh, always tracing from Genesis and moving back through John 20. He says in his commentary on John 20 that he says that what humanity was waiting for was the restoration of the Holy Spirit. And after Christ's crucifixion and, and death and burial and resurrection, he was still waiting for the fullness of this saving gift to receive again the Holy Spirit. That's why he goes through an elaborate commentary on, on that uh, phrase when he tells the disciples, receive the Holy Spirit, the sins you forgive are forgiven, the sins you retain are retained. And he says now that humanity is, has been blessed by this gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, so if you're reading almost any commentary, you will find at some point he will speak about the Incarnation, and at some point he'll speak about the Holy Spirit as life giver and giving us this uh, re reunion between us and God. Um, uh, here he speaks about it even in participation in his flesh, which infuses into us participation in God. Um, he, but he, most of the time, the bread of life for St. Cyril relates to the Eucharist. Um, and this is uh, one from his commentary on John, where, where he'll say, But Jesus hints here in some way at the mystic and more spiritual food, through which being sanctified in both body and soul, we live in him. But we shall see him speaking more openly of this hereafter. The discourse then must be kept for its proper place and time, and he will go, especially when he reaches verse 53, he will go for pages on the mystery of the Eucharist and understanding in uh, John 6. Um, so this is the labor that he says we all have to offer. Um, in his commentary on Genesis, which was just uh, released, I, I was able to get a copy of it before coming here, um, and uh, it's with much eager expectation because the Glafira have, have not been translated uh, into a modern language. I don't think, I think this is the first time. Maybe uh, there are sections of it in, in Arabic. Um, but the Glafira uh, in Genesis haven't been, in Exodus par parts have been translated, and we're still waiting for the publication. Um, but he speaks much about the bread of life as well as the work of the Holy Spirit, especially in the Glafira when you read it. He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Melchizedek gave Abraham his blessing and offered him bread and wine. Christ, the great and true priest, gives us a similar blessing in the Eucharist, the heavenly gift that supports us on our journey through life. There's many things. This is just a few sentences. But you will see here the link between Melchizedek and Abraham, so the new priesthood, which he goes at much length to describe. Uh, he also talks about the blessing in the Eucharist. And we'll talk about this phrase shortly. That was the title of this talk, so I haven't forgotten what we're getting. <laughs> I will leave you with that point. Um, the third thing which he's speaking about, the gifts that support us on our journey. And this theme is very common in St. Cyril because it relates to the, the, the Israelites in the wilderness and the manna that they received. So he said, in our journey in life, that it's the Eucharist that gives us this daily bread or this, this energy so that we can uh, endure throughout the way. This is, this is the, the, the part of those gifts that are Eucharistic. Um, also, the church took this theme and made it after we finish, when we start the Holy Communion, we start with Psalm 150, which is the same for the conclusion of any, uh, any liturgical prayer, whether it's baptism uh, or la'en, uh, blessing of the waters. So we'll finish with Psalm 150. And after, after that, the standard hymn was this, the bread of life. And it's probably relating to this long tradition again of the Eucharist as the bread of life. I don't know what's customary in the churches. I know that there are different traditions, but that's the standard. And <laughs> that's the standard that, that was done. So the bread of life has these three. But for St. Cyril, they're all the same. So I'm, this is more of a, an exercise 
uh, he doesn't give you like in the Western one, two, three. He will just say it's Christ. When he elaborates, you get the fullness of the meaning. So this is just a tool how to approach the writings of Saint Cyril. Um, so as he says, the living bread, which is the locus of God, nourishes us spiritually. It is written, and bread with strengthens a man's heart. This bread frees us from bondage and lust, and it adorns our souls with the splendor of freedom. So it's he's speaking about in, in the first chapter something else completely. But when you read the commentary, you'll find these nuggets of truth that are sprinkled throughout, and that's typical for Saint Cyril, as if he is already coming with the body of you know the, the the teachings of the church whether it's through the incarnation like i said the sacrifice of christ on the cross the eucharist the the blessing of the holy spirit the gifts in baptism and he will apply that wherever that's why they say saint cyril's um, exegesis is a theological one and when he does uh, theology he does it exegetically the two are always uh, the same for saint cyril and even more so, we say that it's Eucharistic, like his approach, it, it, or sacramental, uh, that he, he, it's not uh, independent courses like we have today. Everything is a package. So whether you're talking about Genesis, whether you're talking about Christology, that it's as if you're studying the same subjects with different focus. Um, it's a matter of time. Like I said, if you can read any commentary of St. Cyril, um, you will you will be leave from there with the same content but in different packaging. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't make it boring though. It just uh, makes it. That's why if you read one commentary, it's it's challenging. The first commentary is the most challenging. But when you get to the second and third, it is uh, refreshing because there's something old and something new. And speaking of newness, this is also a theme in Saint Cyril. He will always speak about the new and contrast it with the old. So the liturgy for him is always new and renews us. The teaching is always new, even when it's in the Old Testament, uh, that he is speaking about the new teachings of Christ in the newness of the Spirit, which, was prof which were prophesied in the old. Uh, he speaks about the priesthood as being renewed, uh, like I mentioned that quotation from uh, relating to Melchizedek. Uh, Melchizedek appears as a shadowy figure in Genesis 14 as well as the Psalms but we don't really have a clear picture of him until Hebrews and so Saint Cyril has elaborate commentary when he speaks in Hebrews about Melchizedek because it represents it's a picture of Christ's offering in Genesis and that's why in the ancient churches whether it's in Rome or even in Egypt that they would have Melchizedek somewhere on the eastern niche of the church as this picture uh, that was you know, the type of Christ the priest in the, the earliest chapters in Genesis as well as new worship that's why he wrote his first book <coughs> in worship of God in spirit and truth uh, taken from John 4 24 this passage to the Samaritan woman and he says all I write which is for this to explain this verse as well as Matthew 5 it took him 17 books <laughs> but this 17 books summarized the Mosaic books. So he took from all of the, uh, the, the major passages that were um, in the Pentateuch. And then after a while he said, I left some things out. So he wrote the Glephira, Elegant Commons, which is another series of books, but in a different perspective. The first one is a little bit more historical. Uh, uh, exegetical. The second one, a little bit more theological, but it's done in a types. So he'll take different types of Christ uh, throughout this more personal figure to emphasize that. <coughs> um, he also speaks about uh, virtues, uh, but I want to reach now to the life-giving blessing. The life-giving blessing, which is probably the major phrase of the Eucharist in the writing of St. Cyril. And usually we don't hear about it uh, too much. You'll hear about blessing, or you'll hear about sacrifice for origin, St. Cyril of Jerusalem, St. Basil. They'll refer to the Eucharist as the life-giving sacrifice. 
Eflogia Zeoipios. But they will also say that the liturgy can be used as blessing, or it's understood as blessing. The gift of the Holy Spirit, or what was Augustine used as sacrament, for uh, St. Cyril it's blessing. Christ himself is the blessing, or he can give the priestly blessing, right, that is offered in the church. But when you use the term life-giving blessing, it's something unique that only relates to the Eucharist. Uh, that's why I would say when we have the offering uh, of the bread, of the uh, loaves, that from the five, there's one that is chosen. The five are then blessed. They become the blessing. But the Eucharist, the one after the Holy Spirit descends, it becomes the life-giving blessing. So distinguish the two, that he'll say one is life-giving, the other one is a blessing that we receive. And when we take the same thing in Arabic, we say, you take Lokmat and Baraka, or Eflogia, Eulogia. This is what we take to leave the church. Someone who can take communion, the life giving blessing, we will share with them the blessing that we received. And that distinction is in the writings of St. Cyril. When he uses the term life giving, it's relating to the work of the Holy Spirit in sanctifying humanity that gives life for our uh, uh, souls. He says in the worship of God, as long as he has adorned us with adoption gifts or the gifts of adoption, he has poured over us the good things, that is himself, as a perfect sacrifice and lamb, led to the slaughter for our sakes. He has granted us the possibility to share in the life-giving blessing, which is the partaking of his holy body and his holy blood. This, I think, is what the sheep, wine, wheat and wine refer to, those that are in the seventh day, that is in the spiritual Sabbath. These, they have been called to freedom due to the master's kindness. So he's talking about uh, a completely different passage where he finds the Eucharist and he uh, explains about the sacrifice of Christ as the lamb for our sake. That's why we say in the institution narrative that uh, his hands, which are without spot or blemish, blessed and life-giving. Um, the same thing you find it used throughout the liturgy. This is from one of his last commentaries. Uh, it, they were delivered as sermons. And these are the ones that we know that were after the Nestorian controversy because it's very easy to know if he's writing before the controversy or after the controversy because he will only mention the controversy in his writings. So these are shorter sermons uh, and reflections on um, different parts from the Gospel of St. Luke. So at the end of this, he has this passage. But <clears throat> he is also within us in another way by means of our partaking in the oblation of bloodless offerings, which we celebrate in the churches, having received from him the saving type of the right, as the blessed evangelist plainly shows us in the passage which has just been read. For he tells us that he took a cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it with one another. Now, <clears throat> that's not my tr uh, translation, uh, by his giving thanks by which is meant his speaking to God the Father in the manner of prayer, he signified to us that he, so to speak, shares and takes part in his good pleasure in granting us the life-giving blessing, which was then bestowed on us. So he's saying that even when we take communion, Christ is the one giving to us through the hands of the priest this life-giving blessing. For every grace and every perfect gift comes to us from the Father, by the Son, in the Spirit. This is this was the doxology, you, you know the history behind This was the doxology that was used until the time of St. Basil and the controversy uh, that from the Second Council of Constantinople. Then they changed the doxology to glory be to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But this was the original which St. Cyril uses to speak about uh, how we are saved from the Father through the Son in the Spirit. And then when we offer the Eucharistic gift, that it is done by the Holy Spirit coming on the gifts, changing them from bread and wine to body and blood, or in baptismal waters to the waters of the Jordan, so that we can be children of God and united with the Father. So it happens sacramentally, the reverse. <coughs> Economically, from the Father, by the Son, in the Spirit, and then uh, sacramentally, from the reverse. And this act then was a type 
for our use of the prayer which should be offered whenever the grace of the mystical and life-giving oblations is about to be spread, spread before him by us which we are accustomed to accomplish. For first offering up our thanksgivings, this is Thanksgiving prayer, the gifts that we have, they said, that's the first part, and joining in our praises to God the Father, both the Son and the Holy Spirit. So we draw near to the holy tables, the altars, believing that we receive life and blessing, both spiritually and corporally. <clears throat> for we receive in us the logos of the Father, who for our sakes became man, and who is life, and the giver of life. So this is, like I said, one of the last sermons that he will kind of condense everything together. But it takes some time to unpack. Once you get these little nuggets, so then it's easy to deal with St. Cyril. You know the themes, so reading him is easy. In the beginning, like I said, without it, it's hard to get through. <laughs> the writings of Cyril, especially, he can use one phrase to mean uh, pages. So if you don't have that background, you don't know what he's talking about. But once you have those keys to, to read him, it's actually say he's repeating himself. And uh, glory be to God forever. Even. I take it there are no questions. <laughs> Everything is very easy <laughs> when you deal with uh, St. Cyril. But I tried not to go uh, too far. We have a course in our school devoted to, to St. Cyril, um, which I'm all, I always hesitate to repeat because um, um, I hesitate to repeat because there's, there's so much reading but also I don't know if I start the course I don't know if I will finish uh, speaking um, so do, do we have any uh, questions for his grace I actually have a quick question to say yes, that. Um, you mentioned there the uh, uh, traditional doxology that uh, St. Cyril used, and it, and it brought to mind uh, something which is starting to come up in the literature about uh, the relationship between the, the uh, hermitology of, of St. Cyril and the Filioque, that there is a little bit of thinking now that, that he might have been a bit of a Filioque. <laughs> I, I, so I, um, for, fortunately, that this came in the, um, the footnote, which is in the commentary of St. Cyril's uh, on Luke. Um, and I don't really find it. The problem with the filioque, or for us a problem <laughs> to understand, which is that it's, it's more of a... Um, the origin of it is more from a linguistic there's a linguistic and a theological term. The linguistic in, in the Latin, as you know, there's no distinction between proceed and send. Uh, so it's the same word. Uh, and so that distinction, uh, which is very clear in the Greek, how that you uh, uh, understand or interpret the Greek terms, that's another question. So if he's using ekporevome, like this word for proceed in the same way that later on, uh, was applied is uh, has to be shown, but definitely I don't I, I like Saint Cyril was very well aware of the argument that Saint Basil did in the Second Council of Constantinople. I don't think he took another turn because Saint Cyr Saint Basil was very insistent that you only can use the word proceed to relate to the the, the spirit uh, that proceeds from the from the Father, he, he, or else he says you end up with a grandson or with two fathers. So that wasn't, that wasn't allowed in, for the Cappadocians, and, and St. Cyril inherited that. But this, um, the comments that are made of St. Cyril are, are trying to, um, and unfortunately there are many scholars, uh, Catholic theologians, <laughs> who have brought this uh, about, but like I said, I think it needs a further uh, investigation because it's a reading of St. Cyril, which I don't know if it's... Um, anachronistic to, 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 to do to read something into him uh, that way there's a good article on this again by uh, uh, Marie Bounois she's a French uh, excellent um, a theologian but sh she brought this um, <laughs> uh, concept out and unfortunately has been 
uh, re um, repeated by many Catholic theologians, but the Greek the theologians in Greece have written in Greek against this many, many things. So I think it needs a coming together of those two. Uh, two I don't think we have consensus on it. So. Yes? Can I ask a general question about the Eucharist? Sure. If I may. Um, this was the first time I ever heard the term bloodless sacrifice. Uh, I've always struggled with the idea of a continued sacrifice. Um, we hear so many different terms to describe what's actually happening on the altar. So if you could give me an elementary explanation so we could better serve others, but also just have a direct understanding of what is happening on the altar. So is we don't know. We, <laughs> is it sacrifice what? Is, is it wasn't sacrifice complete by Christ? Is it continued? Yes, so, so we say it, it's once and for all, but it's continued. So St. Cyril, there is a question that uh, St. Cyril addresses specifically on this uh, in one of his later writings. And he says it's one sacrifice that is um, relived. Uh, so that it's not repeated necessarily. He doesn't have to offer it it's once and for all. But when it's offered, again, for us and for the salvation of us, that's why it's continually offered every day for us uh, and for us to take of. There is a subtle uh, difference between the way St. Augustine, St. John Chrysostom, and St. Cyril understand the priest function. So uh, I believe it's St. Augustine who said that he is next to, uh, or sorry, sorry, St. John Chrysostom would say, the priest, the Christ offers next to the priest. <laughs> but um, it's in and through the priest, more for St. Cyril, and also I think Augustine has this, in and through the priest that he's offering the sacrifice. So when he's lifting up the sacrifice, is Christ lifting up that sacrifice through the priest? That's the mystery of the priesthood. That's why we can't fully understand. Like we know in part, but we prophesy in part. So, so the, the gifts that are happening, like Christ himself is offering f to his people for their salvation. Um, and so that's why it's beyond time. The gifts, <clears throat> um, even it was one day in history, but when it relates to God, because God is above time, beyond time. He created time uh, when he created the world. So the heavenly things are like, uh, that's why he says, um, and the time is coming and now is. <laughs> uh, so is it coming or did it happen or did it take place? So this for them is saying, yes, now, now uh, or behold the day of salvation. So the same thing. So yes, this is the day of, when is the day of salvation? Was it on the cross? on the resurrection, or when we were baptized, or is it today? Because the timing for God is, um, so it's, it's beyond, it's beyond, it's a timeless. Uh, that's why we say, this is the day that the Lord has made, which is today, but it's also relating to Sunday, because of the day of the Eucharist, that we receive the eternal and life gift. So it's, it's kind of hard to, uh, pinpoint, but that's what, what they say. I hope I didn't confuse you with the... <laughs> uh, it's, that's not a re-sacrifice. The what? It's not a re-sacrifice. No, it's Christ offered it, but like I said, we're entering into that, that sacrifice. So so he doesn't have to come and offer it, because that, then you get into the problem, um, and, and this is his question. So if, I, if there's a liturgy you know, at St. Mark and one at St. Mary, and at the same time, so how does it work? Or if you have in in some churches and different altars on this, so it's it, it can't it's not repeating the sacrament, but re-entering we say into that the the the, the offering of Christ. If we use that term, I, I try to remember the exact term that he used. Can you just elaborate a little bit more on what the Saint Cyril's mindset? when he uses the word blessing. Because I feel like the word blessing has many meanings to many people depending on sort of what context you use it. It's in. the same. So it's the same. He has many terms to use it. But a blessing could mean a grace. 
So just like the term grace is also used, uh, and that can be a general grace or a sacramental grace. So he can refer to baptism as a blessing, or he can refer to the blessing that's in baptism, so one specific prayer. So um, when, uh, when there is the, at the end of the baptism and for comfort, when the priest breathes and says, receive the Holy Spirit. So in the modern, after Trent, we say, okay, that's the second sacrament. Before it was just the sacrament of initiation. But uh, this gift, this grace, uh, St. Cyril will refer to and say that this is a blessing, or uh, maybe even, I don't know if he uses the term life-giving blessing, because it's a sacrament, but to say that this is a gift. Baptism as a whole can be a gift. Or the blessing of life, like the, of, <coughs> of meditating on the scriptures, God bless, can be a blessing. So it's a, it, he has a general terms. But like I said, sometimes he can refer to the Eucharist as blessing, but more specifically, he usually will say life-giving blessing. So with terminology, like I said, there's uh, St. Cyril uses very specific terms to lead to big concepts, and sometimes he changes them just so you don't get bored, but within limits, <laughs> within limits. <laughs> Thank you very much for an enlightening uh, insight you. into, I think, a very complex subject from a very complex author. Mm. Um, since Cyril um, wrote a lot about uh, a lot of our understanding of the incarnation comes from his own works, um, and, and uh, as Your Grace has said, um, he, he, he will uh, approach the same topics from different angles. Um, is there a parallel in his approach to the Incarnation um, with his approach to the Eucharist in terms of the limitless God occupying a human form um, and at the same time the perpetual sacrifice occupying the bread that's on the earth? Yes, so I, I, and this is a very important point because I didn't mention that um, in the Nestorian controversy there's a whole whether it's, whether it's in the third letter or it's in one of the twelve anathema or it's in his writings afterwards that's related specifically to the Eucharist because for uh, us if you misunderstand the incarnation you will misunderstand the Eucharist and if your incarnational teaching is, is correct then so also so for Nestorius if you divide too much between humanity and divinity then what do you eat? you either eat flesh or you eat divinity so, but for St. Cyril, he said, he's one. We partake of Christ. And he said, well, what do you call it? You call it flesh? No, he said, life-giving flesh. The same thing we say in the liturgy. To distinguish, it's not pure flesh, and we don't eat divinity, because divinity does not change. You can't uh, consume the divinity, or else we would be gods in the same way that God is. Uh, so, but what we take is divine. <laughs> so he will you say, well, what, what's the difference? So then he'll cite Second Peter one four, and he'll say here, it's very clear we become partakers of divine nature. What does that mean? Uh, to partake uh, and to become. <laughs> how how does it work? And he will elaborate. But but um, the issue for him uh, wasn't that. I think I think Nestorius more had an issue with uh, what he he doesn't know what it is. Like, I, I tried many times to read. Well, we have a writing from Nestorius, what wasn't burned, what survived <laughs> in parts, were in uh, uh, the Bazaar. It's called Bazaar of Nestorius. And so it, it's not consistent, because he wants to say that it's not div divinity, and it's not flesh, but at the same time you say, okay, well, what is it? And said it's a gift that we receive. So then say, okay, so then you don't, this is not real communion. So then he had to defend himself, say, no, 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 it's a communion. But he didn't, there's no solution for him. That's what we call the coherence of the fathers, that it's, it's very clear. If you accept the incarnation, you accept the Eucharist as life giving body and blood, and that's how we partake of it and we, we benefit from it. That's why he says corporally and spiritually, because we eat. Uh, this life-giving flesh. Any other questions? Uh, 
I said, no, I know this might be a little bit off topic, but um, can you uh, sort of give any information on why this seems to be a trend in the whole anti-Saint Cyril attitude and, and uh, why this has come about and when it actually started to come about? So it came by um, a, a historian called Gibbon, but it was a fictional history <laughs> of... Um, the murder of Hypatia, I don't know if you've heard, come across this, and uh, also the expulsion of the Jews from Alexandria. And because of it, in the 1800s, when they were translating the Nicene post-Nicene, although they had a version of St. Cyril's commentary on John uh, and other writings, that they excluded it from because they thought it was not acceptable. Uh, due to the work of many scholars in the last 50 years, so it took a lot, a lot of time <laughs> for them to have an assessment, uh, as uh, was mentioned in the introduction of uh, St. Cyril. Um, Magakin played uh, Father John uh, uh, a large role in this, as well as many other scholars who were writing the same thing. Um, and unfortunately, you can't... Like He was blamed for what happened in the city, although there were many issues uh, that uh, was not, I don't think... Um, he is the, the culprit behind it. And if you read his commentaries, I think it's, it's very clear. And his position against the Jews in Alexandria, there's part of it, yes, that's political uh, in the sense of control uh, in uh, the city at that time. But part of it um, is really uh, exegetical. And in his commentaries in the Old Testament, it's very clear, like what represents the fullness of uh, prophecy and fulfillment of prophecy, which was rejected, uh, and so uh, there were there were unfortunately some Christians in uh, Egypt at the time that were converting to Judaism, <laughs> and Saint Cyril can't. That's why he goes to a lot of detail to see how this took place, and they were targeting uh, Christians. So um, uh, there is a lot of work that was. Uh, that he that he took, uh, and he wasn't the only one. John Chrysostom did the same, but I don't know why they target Cyril <laughs> in a way as if nobody else before. But it was a problem in the ancient world, the relationship between Judaism and, and Christianity, uh, and so unfortunately, uh, the modern world didn't. He wasn't very favorable. When I went to study, and I told them, "No, I want to study Saint Cyril." Said, "Of course, because you're Egyptian." But at the same time, he was popular. He's still popular because. You know, everyone's translating him now. They like to read something about Saint Cyril. He, his theology is extremely advanced, um, and I think you know I'm, we're, I'm biased, but I think it's well, <laughs> at the top. But um, uh, you, it's really hard to find someone at his level, whether even exegetically or the, uh, christologically or even Eucharistic. Like the, there's, it's, it's very high. <laughs> I don't know, I have to go back and look, I don't know if he relates it directly to um, the Eucharist as much because from the time of St. Athanasius, this was the debate of is, is it real body, is he a ghost? Is, so most of the discussion was about his humanity and the glorification of humanity in it. Uh, so that, ten that tension or uh, the between the human and divine is what was the focus for Saint Athanasius, and also to my recollection, that was also the focus of, of Saint Cyril. Um, he does relate the blessing of the five loaves, like I said, as the introduction to what happens afterwards uh, in the Eucharist, and that that's a very um, because, uh, like I said, the blessing. 
uh, is relating to the life-giving blessing. But um, I don't know if he makes a specific comment on this uh, passage, uh, to my knowledge. Uh, certainly, so I'm just wondering from what you've said in the, in the lecture and then from some of these questions, when St. Cyril is reading uh, the Old Testament or the New Testament and exegeting it, what is the relationship between his method and Oregon of Alexandria? Oh, very so I've heard good. conflicting things. I've heard that he really didn't like Oregon and then that he, well, you know, ha, ha, is he using Oregon's method? Yes and yes. Oh. <laughs> so, so the reason why he, there was a, a controversy with Origen from the beginning, I was just talking to <laughs> Father Daniel about it. But at the same time, his writings are like... Um, there, there's nothing like it in the ancient world or in, even in the modern world. So all the fathers read Origen, and then there's debated parts about which, did he really write it? Did he really mean this? So those debates were from the beginning till now. Um, we're starting only to get some clarity with what was authentically Origen. But even Origen has a writing to, um, in one of his letters say, I didn't write this. They, told, they, they are accusing me that I wrote this, and I didn't write that. Uh, at the same time, you, he has conflicts, different conflicts with um, uh, bishops, which is not always <laughs> a good thing, and that continued with him until now. Um, but definitely, he's one of the main, because he comes from this, the school of Alexandria uh, as one of uh, its first deans, and his teaching is Alexandrian, especially in the typology of scripture. Most people, when they take on first principles, and they say there's four categories uh, or senses which Origen has. Um, so the literal, the spiritual, the tropological, and the historical. Is that, did I miss one? Uh, uh, anagogical. Uh, uh, anagogical. 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 Um, uh, so um, for St. Cyril, there's only two, but you can have two aspects, just the literal and historical, and then the spiritual, typological, tropical, <laughs> how it relates to us in different ways, but the second one is mainly Christological, mainly, mainly, as a type of Christ and how it relates to us, whether Christ in baptism, in the Eucharist, in the church, in prayer, uh, uh, however. Uh, and so it's a simplified version. Sometimes even Origen's commentary is a very over complicated like it's very advanced <laughs> and but then it can get too so it might not be coherent but that's not the point of origin origin is to give you a spiritual commentary so you can be in the clouds and you are in the, <laughs> in the clouds with origin. but sometimes it might not make sense <laughs> uh, and that's where the conflicts start to happen especially in this trinitarian theology because you're talking about before any council so he'll be accused later on, oh, he, uh, Isaiah chapter 6, it's, he understood it as a trinity, as Father, Son, and Spirit. Whereas uh, St. Cyril, very clear, no, it's the only begotten Son and two angels. The same thing with the three visitors to Abraham. Um, and then, you, so you can accuse him of Trinitarian thinking after uh, writing before the council by many years. And this was the tension. Um, that's why Didymus said, don't condemn uh, the people, condemn the concepts. Because uh, they were insisting for him to reject origin, and he, he wouldn't. Um, so there's always, um, or, origin, you need a lot of energy <laughs> to deal with origin. And uh, it's, you, you will come benef benefiting, but the church kind of helped to put those boundaries to say what, where are the limits uh, of the, the scripture and so on. <clears throat> so it's a, it's a, we were just talking about having a whole course uh, on origin, because we did uh, two for St. Athanasius, we did one for St. Cyril, uh, we were about to do the Cappadocians, and then we're debating whether or not we do origin, or, so we'll see, we, we could get in trouble <laughs> doing a course on origin, but uh, uh, I even told uh, Father Daniel, maybe we'll do Origen and Augustine together. So, you know, maybe <laughs> <laughs> very beneficial <laughs> class. I took a course when I was at Notre Dame. On the, it, was, it was one of my favorite courses uh, uh, to take. Um, 
and I didn't. I don't think I wrote anything wrong uh, <laughs> in the paper. But I mean, you you can see because the two of the greatest minds in the Christian world. So you can't deny. Did were are there mistakes? Definitely attributed to them. Uh, but as Augustine said, I didn't write any mistakes. I corrected whatever was not clear. But you know, there are mistakes, but they're not mistakes, as he <laughs> as he says. So. Thank you very much. So we'd just like to um, to thank His Grace Bishop Kronlos for um, this lovely lecture and for taking our questions so patiently. Um, just last night I received a phone call from Father Tadros Rubmalati, who's a, a very prolific scholar in the Coptic Church. And so I said to him, uh, you, you won't believe who's coming tomorrow night. He said, who? I said, Bishop Kronlos from Los Angeles. He said, oh. He goes, I knew him when he was in year seven. <laughs> and he said, he, he was a great boy. <laughs> and, then, and then he went on and said, therefore, he's very unique. <laughs> so I'm not sure what he meant by that. But uh, it, it seems that you were marked out from a very young age. And we're now seeing the fruits of that. So thank you so much for blessing us. Um, we'd like to present to you a, a small gift, um, which... Michael can probably describe better than I, but it, it is a, an icon of the Theotokos, uh, St. Mary, um, but in an Aboriginal style, so an Australian kind of context. Thank you very much. So we'll just conclude um, this evening's proceedings. Michael can just let us know what's happening up. Yeah, so we've just got some... Uh, uh, Nibble is upstairs if you'd like to join us and uh, just very quickly as well I just want to draw your attention to the bookstall at the back and in particular actually we have a wonderful uh, series